Father which art in heaven, we are so thankful for thy Son, Jesus Christ, and for the privilege, Lord, of being your children. And we ask in a special way that you would tabernacle with us longer and manifest yourself to us in a greater and more special way, because we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Brothers and sisters, we have some tremendous things to study this morning. Are you ready to study the Word of God? God has brought us safely through another week, and by God's grace, he wants us to seek a blessing in his house. Amen? Amen. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 5 before we really get going this Sabbath morning. We're going to the book of Luke, the fifth chapter, and by God's grace, I'm excited that you and I can study with Jesus. You know that people get excited about meeting with someone special. If a person was going to a concert in this world, they're excited because the so-called star, the celebrity, is going to be there. When someone is a political uh, person, they, they are excited when their politician, their particular politician party is there. In fact, sometimes they have standing room only, seats, tickets sold out. And then you come to church and somebody seems common when the king of the universe is coming into town. It is a wonderful thing to be in the presence of God. What do you say? Amen. In fact, in the book of Luke chapter 5, let's turn there quickly. Luke chapter 5, notice what the Bible says in Luke 5. And we want to begin in verse 17. Put yourself in this particular situation. Luke chapter 5. Notice what the Bible says, beginning in the 17th verse. Let's read that together. Now, Jesus had already prayed all night long. And then the Bible says in verse 17. Are you there? Amen? amen. Let's read that together. The Bible says, Father, please anoint these words as we have opened it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Verse 17, it says, And it came to pass on a certain day as he, that is Jesus, was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors. Who were there? Pharisees and doctors. Very interesting. We'll keep that word there. There are Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. In other words, this was no small meeting. They came from the uh, rural areas and they came from the city areas. Jerusalem was a big city. Uh, as it were, the Galilee and all these other the, in the other areas around, some of them were considered, depending on where you were, rule. So the Bible says they came out of Judea and Jerusalem and the power of the Lord was present to heal. I'm going to put a slash here. I'm going to put over here. Heal. As Jesus was teaching. The presence of the Lord was present. What does present mean? You ever been in grade school? I don't know if they do it today, but years ago, <laughs> and some of the teachers may have to tell me, but years ago, they, I don't know about today, but years ago, they, the teacher would say, Johnny, present. present. <laughs> Susie, present. present. And they went down the list. Today, I don't know if they still do it, Brother Tim. <laughs> but what did you mean when you said present? That mean you had a gift to a a offer somebody present? What did you mean by present? You meant that you were there. So when the Bible says that the, that, the, that the presence of the Lord was present to heal them, that meant that what? God was there. I want to ask you a question. When you come to church, is God there? Now listen, if God is there, it doesn't matter who's not there. If God is there, everybody who needs to be there is there. And when a person understands that, then it doesn't matter the size of a church. It doesn't matter if it's a so-called mega church, which has its problems, or a so-called mini church that could have a problem if God is not there. Someone says, what about the pastor? Well, that's not the significant point. What about the elder? That's not the significant point. What about this thing or that? That's not the significant point. Uh, what, what do the pews look like? Does the air work? That, that's not the significant point. Well, what is the program? The significant point is, is God there? Amen. Not if he's there, everything's all right. <laughs> now, my brothers and sisters said that as Jesus was teaching, guess what? God was there. And the spirit of the Lord was present to heal. Now I want to ask you a question. Was the spirit of the Lord present because the doctors were there? No. The Pharisees. No. That's not why they, the, the, the spirit of the Lord was there. That's not why. But now I want to ask you a question. Now, if we understood what a doctor really was, we would not use that word so carelessly. Carelessly. Our study today is not what doctors are. That's not our study. But I will tell us this, that if there's a doctor there, now look at the name itself, doc, doc. 
Does that sound like, if you, what does that sound like? Does that sound like anything to you? Doctor. Doctrine. Doctrine. Teaching. Teaching. That's actually what it means, teaching. So a doctor is really a teacher, someone who makes known something. Now, when a person is called a MD, what, are they, what, are they, what does that mean? What does that mean? Medical doctor. If someone is, has a PhD, what does that mean? <laughs> that would be someone who came to BTI. I mean. <laughs> but what, what does it mean, the word itself? What does the word itself mean from the uh, ones who projected as uh, uh, this wonderful thing? What does it mean? You ever thought about it? PhD. Uh, PH stands for philosophy. Philosophy. And the D is for doctor. So a PhD is the doctor of philosophy. He's not a medical doctor. So a person can have a PhD in economics or a PhD in business or a PhD in agriculture or a PhD in any field of knowledge because then it's saying the philosophy, he has doctored that philosophy. Now, my brothers and sisters, when we use those words, it makes us not understand something. Now, if it's really a doctor, you know what he should be able to do? He should be able to heal. Now, someone says, what do you mean? I want you to think about this the next time you hear that word. Now, if, if there was a doctor in economy, a doctor of economics, are there many PhDs, in, 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 uh, uh, many who have PhD in ec economics? Yes. Now, think about this right now. Are there any economic diseases? Yes. What is the economic disease? Debt. 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 Now, if there was a PhD in economics, you know what he should be able to heal? The diseases of that field. The diseases of their field of economy. But today we have thousands of doctors in America and around the world of economics and still the disease of, de uh, of, econ uh, of debt is still here. You know what that tells us? That's not a doctor. You have a doctor in psychology or a doctor in, in the mind or a doctor in business. But all the while businesses are failing right now. The diseases that are in that field is still there. You have a doctor in, in, in environmental science, but the diseases are still here. What is it suggesting to us that really we have no doctors? Because if we really had a doctor, no matter what he doctored in, he should be able to at least heal the disease of his field. Amen. Amen. And so my brothers and sisters, I praise God that Jesus is a doctor. Amen. He's a teacher. Amen. The great physician now is near. The sympathizing Jesus. Do you want Jesus? Yes. Now, you know why that's a blessing? Because it doesn't matter what our problem is when we come to church. If God is there, our problem can be solved. Amen. If God is there, our problem can be healed. Because Jesus is a doctor in every field of life. What a wonderful thing. What do you say? Amen. Now, if you go to the doctor, you're expecting a few things. At least three. If he's a good doctor. <laughs> Number one. You're expecting an analysis. A what? Analysis. analysis. Two, you're expecting a diagnosis. And three, you're expecting a remedy or cure. What three things did you expect from a doctor? Number one, a what? Analysis. Number two, a what? Diagnosis. Number three, a what? Remedy or cure. What is the remedy? What is the cure? What does that mean? That means the program, the plan that if I follow, it heals the disease. Now, there wouldn't be a problem if a man was a doctor and he gave the evidence or the plan of what to do and a man didn't do it. He's still sick. The problem is not the doctor. The problem is us not carrying out what the doctor has prescribed. Am I right? There are prescriptions. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that when you come to church, you should expect an analysis? You should expect a diagnosis. You should expect a remedy. If you have not gotten those three things, or if it's not somewhere in the program, you might be at the wrong church. Because the physician may not be there. Because if the physician is there, one of the first things he's going to do, if you come to a physician, he's not just going to treat you. He's not just going to deal with you. That the first thing he does, if he's a good physician, a good doctor, what's the first thing he does? Talk to me, somebody. He analyzes. And he looks at you and your condition, your family, the community in which we belong, the church, the nation, the world. And he says, as he analyzes, he's looking for what the cause of the problem is. And once he analyzes and understands, you know what he can do? 
Now he can say, I can now give you a what? Diagnosis. What is that diagnosis? That diagnosis is a, is a statement of what the problem is. That diagnosis is an intelligent understanding of what that problem is so that I can tell you what your problem is. Why, if you can't tell me my problem, don't talk to me about the remedy. You don't know. If you don't understand my problem, you cannot understand the solution to my problem. Does that make sense? So now when we come to church, do you know that we have family problems, economic problems, health problems, all problems in life. And the doctor is here to help us. And I'm so glad that even today that the Lord is present. What do you say? Amen. Do you want some help? Yeah. Now imagine if you came to that doctor. Amazing. We say to the earthly doctors, we give them more faith than we give the doctor Jesus. If the earthly doctor says you have five months to live, no one says to that doctor, time setter. They're happy or sad, depending on their condition, that they can recognize that that doctor has understood something of the nature of the disease and can tell you, you don't have long left. Now, my brother and sister, can you imagine going to the hospital? I want you to analyze that picture for a moment. Just analyze it. Don't say anything. Just analyze it. Look at the picture. And analyze it. And after a little while, you can begin to discern what's happening. Now, those who are in the medical profession, I see we have some here today. What is this a uh, depiction of there? What is this a depiction of right here? Something that's dealing with life support. Now, who are these right here? These are family members who care about the patient. Here's the patient right here. And here's a physician trying to help that patient. Now let's bring it a little more in. Does that patient look interested? <laughs> Who is this patient? Talk to me somebody. This is the church. And I'll be honest with you. If you look at the eyes of that patient. And you look at the brow of that patient. And you look at those looking on at that patient you know the state that that patient is in. You can give an analysis and know the state of that patient. Where's your analysis? He's about to die. He's not dead yet, but he's dying. He's at the point of death. The Bible speaks of being at the point of death. But you know, Jesus can help somebody even at the point of death. And you can see that, 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 that for the doctor that is supposed to be there assisting, you can see he doesn't know much of what else to do. Not so much by the praying, because you should do that at the beginning. <laughs> But look at the sweat on his face. Look at the condition of his eyes. He's in a, a somber state because he doesn't know that there's much hope left. You can see that it's been there for a little while. The life support is, is going down. And you can see that they have no idea what to do. Now, if we were looking at the Seventh Adventist Church or any church for that matter, this is the condition that we see right now. You know, church in Europe is dying. All churches. I don't care what. The, I'm not talking about just Seventh Baptist, Methodist. Church in Europe is, is almost completely dead. The church in different places is dying. Right here in America, North America, the church is dying. And do you know that God has given the seven Adventists this healing solution? You and I have the solution, not just to the seven Adventist church, but to the Christian church and to Christendom and into world religions. God has given the answer to us. But you know, the sad thing is. We're dying just like everybody else. Because we won't take his analysis his diagnosis and his remedy. But now my brothers and sisters, look what the prophet says, Christian service 42. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of what? So of everything we need, what is the greatest thing we need? Talk to me somebody, a revival. Now, does the revival go by itself? No. Now it says the time has come for a third reformation to take place. When this reformation begins, the spirit of prayer will actuate every believer. And we'll banish from the church the spirit of discord and strife. So if we ever want to get a revival and a reformation, we have to start what? Talk to me, somebody. Praying. What is that physician supposed to be doing? Praying. What was that preacher doing? Praying. Christian service 42, a revival and a reformation must take place under the ministration of the Holy Spirit. What is our greatest need? Revival and reformation. Now, question. Is revival and reformation the same thing? No. No. What is the difference? If I were to ask you, 
What is the difference between revival and reformation? What would you tell me if I would ask you, what is the difference between revival and reformation? What would you tell me? What would you tell me? So revival wakes a man up. Why? Revival brings that man back to life. All right, someone else. Well, then what is reformation? What is reformation? A change. Now, what happens if I wake up, but there's no change? What happens? You go back to sleep, yes. But talk to me in, this, in, the, in the form of healing, in the form of sickness, in the form of disease, in the form of health. Uh, here's a man. He's lived all of his life and he's been eating high cholesterol. He's been eating pork. He's been eating ribs. He's been eating Kentucky Fried Chicken. And the grease has been getting thicker and thicker and thicker. His arteries begin to become lined. He needs triple bypass. Do people need like that in Virginia? Is that necessary? He takes a triple bypass. Now his arteries are opened up, cleared out. Question. He has now been given a revival. He's been given a new lease on life. What if he continues the way he's been living? It'll just be a matter of time before he's in a worse condition than he was in before. You know that when a man gets a triple bypass, he, doesn't know, he never comes back to the same. He either gets better or worse. And so my brothers and sisters, what happens if there's no re reformation with revival? If there's no reformation with revive, revival, that means it's only a matter of time before we're dead again and then we get worse than we were spiritually. But you know, have you ever passed by, and I don't care what the church is, normally if it's a, a, a Seventh Adventist church or a Pentecostal church or a Baptist church, in the spring, they have spring what? Revival. You, when is the last time that you passed a sign that says spring revival and reformation? You know that the average church does not speak of a, let's have a revival and reformation because that signifies something that the masses are not interested in doing. Change. Do you know that you and I are creatures of habit? We don't like change, but do you know that you cannot get a different result unless you introduce a change? And that if a man does not want the same results, then he can't do the same things. It has been said it's insanity to want different results and do the same thing. And I think that person is right. Now, revival, look what it says. It says revival signifies, number one, a renewal of spiritual Life, a quickening of the powers of mind and heart, a resurrection from the spiritual death. Reformation, though, is something different. It says reformation, talk to me somebody, does what? Signifies a reorganization. What's the next two words? A change. Now question, when I deal with revival, immediately it's life from death. When I deal with reformation, immediately I'm dealing with what? Talk to me, somebody. Change. Now, if I've been resurrected from the dead, but I live the same way that I did before I was resurrected, I will die again. Physically or spiritually. So now, my brothers and sisters, how does change happen? Watch now. Reformation signifies reorganization, a change. But notice now, a change in what? Ideas. Now, I didn't say change in action. Now, it includes a change in action, but that's not how we change. It says reformation signifies reorganization, a change in ideas and theories. Now, we'll stop right there for a moment. If it says a change in ideas and in theories, what is it talking about? Someone says, well, I don't want uh, to deal with theoretical things. I want to be practical. But do you know that in order to change practices, you must change one's theory? And that if you change one's practices without changing his theory, it's only a matter of time before he goes back to what he was. And that's why when we deal with reform, we have to do more, deal, we deal with more than just actions. And any change in life, in order to get healing, we have to be taught a different way of living. In order to be healed of our diseases, there has to be a different way of living. In order to get a change in my way of living, I cannot just change actions. I must change ideas. Theories must change that I hold in order for there to be a change in my life. Does that make sense? Yes or no? And so my brothers and sisters, the average person does not understand. When you say change in ideas or theories, what do you mean? Tell me what you mean. The way you think, Sister Debbie. So what this is really telling me 
is that if there's going to be a change in my life before the practices and habits stay changed forever, my ideas and theories must change. In other words, my thinking must change. So if I'm going to have a reformation, God must change the way I think. You know, I have an idea about diet and an idea about dress and an idea about families and an idea about marriage. But how do I know my ideas are right? The average person embraces his ideas as right and that it belongs to himself. And while everyone can choose for themselves, it doesn't make the way right. God gives us the ability to choose, not the ability to, to, to describe what is right and wrong. Somebody that makes the freedom of choice, the ability to rewrite truth. That's not true. Did you understand what I said? A man can say, well, the seventh day is the Sabbath. That may be his idea. Uh, a man may say the first day is the Sabbath. That may be his idea, but that doesn't make false true. Even if it's his idea. Are you following? Now, my brothers and sisters, we have to understand truth. Revival, it says, uh, reformation signifies reorganization, a change in ideas and theories, habits and practices. Does it change our habits? Yes or no? Does it change our practices? Yes or no? But what is changed first in order to change habits and practices if it's true reformation? What is changed first? Our ideas, our theories, in other words, our thinking. Does that make sense? Now, re revival and reformation are to do their appointed work. And in doing this work, they must what? I'm going to ask you a question. A dead man, how much thinking does he do? The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not. Anything. Neither is there any more thoughts. Their memory perished, their thoughts gone. So a dead man can't think. So if I'm trying to reform without first letting Jesus revive me, I'm going to try in vain. Even trying to change my thinking will be in vain if I don't first go to Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, who said over the rent grave of Lazarus, though I am dead, yet he that believe in me, though he are dead, yet shall he live. Do you want to live? Yes. Then changing your thinking is the secret. No. The secret is Jesus. I come to Jesus even before my thoughts change. Even before my thoughts change, I can go to God and say, Lord, I have wrong thoughts. Can Jesus change how I think? Praise God. What do you say? All right. Reformation will not bring forth the good fruit of righteousness unless it is connected with the revival of the. So which one do we need revival or reformation? We need both. Which one comes first? Revival. What comes next? Reformation. And this is the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs. Now, do you want to help the community? Yes or no? Yes. Now, we're getting ready. I told you we're getting ready to transition. To where not only are we going to be a blessing to us in here, but we have to learn how to become a blessing into the community and the nation and the world in which we belong. Is the world in trouble right now? Yeah. One of the things that we must understand is how are we going to bring solution? In the community, there must be an analysis. There must be a diagnosis and there must be a remedy. Now, watch this for a moment. The restoration and uplifting of the seven Adventist church. Is that what it says? No, it doesn't say that. This is the relief book, Ministry of Healing 349. Let's read it together. It says, the restoration and what else? Uplifting, not of the church, but of what? Humanity. Now, who does that include? Everybody. What about the Catholic? The Baptist? The Muslim? The Hindu? The atheist? The satanic worshiper? The uplifting of humanity begins where? Now, this is, this is a secret that the majority of the world knows nothing about, what we're talking about right now. So if I'm going to restore a community or a church or a world for that matter, it begins where? Done in there, but that's where it begins. It begins in the home. So if I'm going to help a community, what community are we in right now? What community? Rich lands. If I'm going to help rich lands, I start by going to the civic center. I start by going to the governor's office. No. Well, well, that's the governor. That's the state of Virginia. Maybe the mayor. That's... Where must I go if I'm going to begin to uplift Virginia? Now, do you see that the church, when they go from door to door, from house to house, 
their beginning using the, 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 the analysis that Jesus gave the great physician. Did Jesus go from door to door? Yes or no? Did his disciples go from door to door? So I said, well, we're advanced now. We have online. We're all online. We have it. But you know that nothing will take the place from going from house to house and from door to door. Now, my brothers and sisters, we must understand something. Now, this says. Humanity begins in the home. The work of parents underlies every other society, not just the Christian society, but the society of the world is composed of families and is what the is what the what? You better remember that is what the heads of families make it out of the heart are the issues of life and the heart of the the heart of the community, rich in this community or any community, any community, the heart of the church. The heart of the nation, you could say the world, is what? Talk to me, somebody. So if I deal with the home, I'm dealing with both secular and religious problems at the same time. That's a wise plan. What do you say? It says the success of the church, if our church succeeds, it's based on something. The prosperity of the nation. If the nation will be prosperous, we need more than economists. It says the prosperity of the nation depend upon, what's the next word? Home. So what would cause the nation not to prosper? The condition of the home. home. What will fix the condition of the community? The condition of the home. home. What would help the church to finish the work and succeed? The condition of the home. So then what do I need to learn how to heal? What do I need to learn how to heal if I'm going to solve the problems of the world? Talk to me, somebody. The home. The home. The home. And so God is trying to show me this. Now, if we study the home, you will find out that we don't have much time left. Someone said, I thought we we're studying hair. Well, you know that God doesn't see much difference between hair and the home. <laughs> and that's why the issue that God begins to deal with before dealing with hair, he deals with head. The homes are what the heads of the home make it. Are you following? We'll come back to that. And the visions of the night. This is Christian uh, uh, councils on health 580 and visions of the night representations passed before me of a great reformatory movement. Do we need that? Yes or no? Yes. Among not the world, but God's people. Many were praising God. Praise God. You're not praising it with me. Amen. It said many were praising God. Talk to me, somebody. Praise, praise God. God. Praise him. Praise him. <laughs> the sick were healed and other miracles were wrought. A spirit of intercession. Give me another name. Give me another name. Prayer was seen. In other words, you could see the church praying. We're going to start talking about how prayer fits into this work. It says, even as was manifested before the great day of Pentecost. Watch it now. Hundreds and thousands were seen visiting what? Prayer. I wonder if she saw Richlands. Amen. By God's grace, she's going to see us in a little while. Amen. Hundreds and thousands were visiting families. Is that a wise program? It says, and opening before them entertainment. No, opening before them the word of God. Then that what must be open to us first? Talk to me, somebody. The word of God. Then what do we need? BTI. Amen. Bible Training Institute to help us to understand and open up the word of God. Hearts were convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit. And a spirit of genuine, what? Talk to me, somebody. Conversion. What does conversion mean? Change was taking place. Change in the church. Change in the home, change in the community, change in the world. Revival and reformation. It says on every side, doors were thrown open to the proclamation of the truth. Do you understand that very soon, do you know that doors are going to be thrown open if we do this work in this community, that they will open up the governor's office and the mayor's office and the city council and schools. You know, it's going to be thrown open because people are looking for solutions right now. It says... The world seemed to be lighted with the heavenly influence. Praise God. Great blessings were received by the true and humble people of God. Now let's read this together. I heard voices of Thanksgiving. It wasn't Thanksgiving Day, but she heard Thanksgiving. And praise. And there seemed to be a reformation such as was witnessed in 1844. The prophet is seeing this at the end of time. Oh, brother and sister, now, I wish I didn't have to read the next paragraph. I wish I didn't have to read the next sentence. But truth doesn't hide from truth. Amen? What's the next sentence? 
Christian Service 580, next sentence. Yet, even though all this was beautiful that was being seen, yet some did what? Refused to be converted. They were not willing to walk in God's way. What does that tell us? God has a what? Way. I want to tell you something. What happens if the church is presented with God's plan of success? Is everybody in the church going to follow? No. Is that happy or sad? It's sad. But God gives every one of us an opportunity. And I want to be among those who take the opportunity. What do you say? Amen. I want to follow in God's way. These covetous ones became separated from, from the company of what? In a little while, there's going to be a shaking. The shaking has already started, but it's going to pick up. And everyone who has not followed Christ in his way will be shaken out. I want to follow Jesus. What do you say? Amen. And listen, we don't have much time. Look what this is. This is the new what? Written in 2018, New Scientist, not a religious magazine. It says, end of days is Western civilization on the brink of what? Now, what do you say? What do you say? Yes or no? We've studied this. Now, we've never seen this article, but we studied this. Now, this article to me is very interesting. It says, history tells us all cultures have their sell by date. You know what that means? All cultures have the expiration date. Do political strife, tripling inequality, and climate change mean that the West time is now up. This is 2018. Now, this article is very interesting to me for a particular reason. I don't have time to go into this other part because that's not my study. But do you know that when people begin to start looking at the sell-by date, people get nervous. Oh, 2025, plus or minus, people get afraid. By not understanding the Bible and not understanding prophecy, not understanding history, not understanding science. Now, here's the new scientists, the thinking men of this world. This is, you know, this, this, this magazine, you can look up the New Scientist and you'll find it's considered one of the most accurate articles or magazines that is presented or that's published today. They study magazines. And you know, you have tabloids, you know, you have different degrees of accuracy. Well, New Scientist is one of the greatest uh, uh, magazines of accuracy in the world. And they consider it not a leftist magazine or a rightist magazine. It's considered to be just giving much of facts with little opinion. Very interesting. I researched this magazine. Now, look what it says. Let me, let me put this up. It says, ah, the good old days when predictions that the end is nigh were seen only on sandwich boards. And doom mongers who carried them were, were easy enough to what? Now, I want you to understand what it's saying. It's saying years ago. When people start talking about the end of the world, most people were talking about it. It was on a sandwich. In other words, you had little, you know, little uh, 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 sandwiches, wrappers, or, 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 or as we would say, candy bars or candies. And they had little Laffy Taffies, you know, and Laffy Remember Laffy? <laughs> well, they, on it, they had, they had little, 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 little comics, little, little, little words, little, little jokes that was on the candy bars and on the uh, candies. But you didn't take it serious. Fortune cookies. A person get a fortune cookie after they had a Chinese meal and they take the fortune cookie and it says, you're going to be very wealthy. <laughs> well, you, you take that with a grain of sand, you know. <laughs> about, there's about 100,000 more of those same ones right in that same box. Am I right? <laughs> that was just to help you sell the meal. The, the fortune cookie. If, if it said you're getting ready to die today, you didn't just all of a sudden give up. And, <laughs> it's not so much that it was greatly accurate. Are you understand what I'm getting at? You can just throw that down. They said, and the only other person that talked about the end of the world were religious people. But now watch what this says. If only things had stayed so what? Now see, you understand. See, 2025 plus or minus, if it was only just the religious man talking about it, it may have seemed very simple that you could just ignore it for a religious fanatic, wide-eyed fanatic. But you can't do that when, brothers and sisters, you deal with something past this. Watch what he says. If only things had stayed so simple, the sandwich boards have mostly gone and the world is still here. But the gloomy predictions keep coming. And not all of them are based on creative interpretation of what? You understand what he's saying? He's saying the end of the world is not just because there are different people looking at the Bible text and they have strange religions and they're making it believe the Mayan calendar said the world's coming to an end. Uh, Seven heaven has said this, uh, uh, this. No, 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 no. It says, it's not based on creative interpretation of religious texts. Let's read this together. 
scientists, historians, and politicians alike have begun to warn that Western culture is reaching a critical what? Now you understand what he's saying? He's saying, almost like what you heard at BTI, that every field of knowledge, you cannot ignore when in every field is telling you the same thing. If you're intelligent, you can't ignore it. It says cycles of inequality and resource use are heading for a what? Tipping point, meaning a limit. That in many past civilizations precipitated political unrest, war, and finally, what else? Talk to me, somebody. And finally, a collapse. So inspiration is telling us that based on what's happening now, that the scientists are looking around and every field of knowledge, every expert is recognizing they cannot ignore the facts that the world is getting ready to collapse. Is that where we are, yes or no? Now, our study this morning is not talking about that. I'm just mentioning to you that they recognize it. Now, I can't go out another time. We'll go back to this and we'll talk about what he actually says. But guess what the man says? He says that based on every field of knowledge, we're on guess what? You know, that's the words actually from inspiration. You know, inspiration actually says that we're on borrowed time in both the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And yet, if we will not read it in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy, God will put it in every field of knowledge so that we can read the handwriting that is on the wall. And it's amazing what all of the fields are saying. I don't have time to go through all the fields, but it's amazing. They're saying almost what Patrick Buchanan said, maybe not all for his reasons, but all saying pretty much the same thing. Will America survive to what? 2025. They don't even recognize any. And my brothers and sisters, I'm praying God give us just a few more years because you and I don't even know the analysis. Let alone the diagnosis. And if we don't have that, you know we haven't got the remedy. And God is trying to bring to us the remedy. What do you say? I want the remedy. What do you say? Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, we get ready to get deep into our study this morning. We've got to do something today. Now, what we've been doing in our study for the last year, we put out, a, a, particularly the last few months, we throw out a lot of pieces of the puzzle. Now it's time, not so much to get new pieces of the puzzle, but now it's time to do what? Arrange those pieces so that we get a final picture. Because we're getting ready to transition in our study. But in order to transition in our study, I want us all to be able to see the picture clearly so that it changes our ideas, changes our theories, changes our thinking, Therefore, it changes our what? Talk to me, somebody. Habits and, practices. and our practices. Do you want to change? Yeah. Our greatest need we already studied is revival and reformation. And so as we get ready to dump out these pieces in the puzzle, we're going to look at these pieces. It's going to seem almost new when you put them all together. And we need to do that so that we can get ready to bring it, our study to a culmination and as we begin the transition. Are you ready? Yeah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're in trouble. And Lord, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see this. If we're intelligent and looking around at the conditions that exist all over this earth, we see in every field of knowledge the handwriting on the wall. We saw in this new article that we, that we looked at today that if it was just religion, people who are not religion, religious could cast it aside. But today, it doesn't matter if a man doesn't even embrace religion, he recognizes that a crisis is well on its way. But he doesn't know what to do about the crisis. He doesn't have any solution. I praise you, O oh God, that you not only identify and analyze the crisis, but you have given us a divine solution. A divine solution. And I pray that this Sabbath morning that you and I, that, that we, Lord, will embrace your divine solution so that we might experience the remedy and the healing that will save not only the world and the community and the church, but will save our own heart and in our own homes. As we started by reading that the Spirit of the Lord is present today, and it doesn't matter who's here or not here, if God is here, then all who needs to be here is here. And so, Father, you are present to heal. And I pray that you will look at us individually, personally, at, at church today, and that you will heal us of whatever things we face this week, this month, this year, in our lives that not only can we be healed, but that you can use us to help many others. We thank you. For we ask all of this, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want us to take our Bibles and turn to the book of Exodus. What book did I say? 
We're going to the book of Exodus, the 15th chapter, Exodus chapter 15. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. We're going to Exodus chapter 15. What book are we going to? Exodus, Exodus the 15th chapter. That's the second book of the Bible. Now, I want to ask you uh, today, as we look at this, everybody here should be taking notes. I don't have to say that to BTI. Every student should be taking notes. Every child should be taking notes. They should grab out their pens, their paper. They should grab out their Bibles, every adult. And if you can write and if you can scribble, you can be taking some form of notes. Now, Exodus chapter 15. Let's turn there quickly. Now, what I want us to do, I, I was talking to God and I was saying to God, Lord, we don't have much time left. How can we begin to understand what we're studying and many other things so quickly, so rapidly? I mean, the signs are everywhere, the handwriting all over the wall. I mean, every week that passes by is getting quicker and quicker, closer and closer. The prophecies that are so great, they're not happening years and years apart. The final movements, we're told, will be rapid ones, and they're not will be. They are rapid ones right now. And as I look at that, I start saying, Lord, how can we understand more clearly? You see, a good teacher, a good teacher didn't just try to teach. You know what a good teacher is always trying to do? A good teacher is always trying to simplify what they're teaching. After they've taught a subject, a good teacher is thinking in his mind, how can I make it more simple? How can I condense it? How can I, I, I say more with less? How can I make it easily be understood? And the greatest teacher in the universe is guess who? Jesus. Jesus. You know, every time he taught, he was teaching, he was thinking how to make it simpler, how to make it better, how to make it easier, how to make it uh, uh, more concentrated. Now, how many like maple syrup? Let me see the hands of those like maple, maple syrup. I love maple syrup. You like maple syrup? Yeah. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Maple syrup doesn't come out the tree like that. <laughs> Someone said, I have a maple tree now. Praise the Lord. Well, you don't go to a maple tree and all of a sudden a bottle of Auntie Mama come out. Now, if you see Auntie Mama, you're in trouble anyway. <laughs> But, but, but maple syrup doesn't just come out of a tree like that into a bottle ready to pour in your pancake. Maple tree, like nature, is like the Bible. Now, when maple syrup comes out of the tree, it doesn't really come out the tree like that. How does it come out the tree? Talk to somebody. It comes out sap. Not maple uh, syrup, but maple sap. And the sap comes out of the tree. Someone says, oh, something's wrong. In fact, if you've ever tasted I've tasted maple sap, and it tastes nothing like maple syrup. So much so that someone would say, I don't want sap, but you'll never get syrup without sap. Now, it's amazing that someone comes to the Bible sometimes and they look at it and say, it's boring. I'm not interested. The Bible is maple sap. And because of that, many are pouring sap on pancakes and don't actually see what's really happening. And then complain about the sap. They come to church and say, oh, it's boring. Oh, it's not interesting. I'm going to tell you something. Someone says, well, a child can't really be focused. A child can't really be attentive that long. Let me tell you something. <clears throat> if you put YouTube in front of a child, that child will watch it for two hours, three hours. You put a video game in front of a child and the child won't move. The child, if he doesn't move, he's going to hold on to the, the console. It's amazing that the child if you sit him in front of a theater or to a, 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 you take him to a movie theater somewhere, that child will stay there uninterrupted. And then you would say to yourself, then it may not be his attention problem. Because as long as he's doing what he wants, the adult or the child, we don't change. We're focused. But when it's not of interest to us, something happens. So the problem is not the thing. The problem is God must do something to our what? Our interest. The devil does something to the interest. He takes and makes sap into syrup. But he does it in high fructose syrup. And that's not good for you. But in maple syrup, there's no high fructose if it's done right. But it's still sweet and interesting. Now, my brothers and sisters, what do you have to do to the sap to make it syrup? You have to boil it down. You know it takes time to boil something down? But once you boil it down, do you know that you may start off with a, a, a hundred gallons of sap, but you don't end off with a hundred gallons. The syrup is what? Now, I'm going to tell you some brothers and sisters. Do you know that Jesus, as he was studying, he was trying to think. See, Jesus had to take eternity and condense it into three and a half years. He had to take an eternal message, an everlasting gospel, and he had to condense it into a few short years. And so he's constantly boiling it down, boiling it down. And if you study the life of Christ. 
And far more than we do today, we should study the life of Jesus. It has greater significance to us in the last generation than any other preceding generation. When you look at the life of Christ, you will notice that at the end of Christ's life, he boils down all of his teaching. What he's been teaching year after year after year, he boils down and reduces. In fact, go to Matthew. We'll come back to uh, 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 Exodus chapter 15. We'll come, wait, wait, before, let, no, 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 let me, let, me, let, me, let me not leave Matthew. I don't want to get there yet. Let me, let, let, me, let me stay in Exodus 15 first. I'll get there in a moment. I'll show you what Jesus did in just a moment. But one of the things that God taught through Christ is that the religion of God is the religion of preparation. The religion of God is the religion of what? Now, I want you to write that down in your notes. You should write that down in your notes. That the religion of God is a religion of preparation. Now, all through the Bible, we can see this from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, you will notice. Now, write that down. Write that down. Religion of preparation. You want to write that down. Religion of preparation. Now, listen. Before the flood, what did God tell his people to do? Talk to me. Prepare. Before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, you know what God taught Lord and his people to do? Prepare. Before, brothers and sisters, the first coming of Christ, you know what God taught his people to do? Prepare. In fact, he sent John the Baptist. What was the work of John the Baptist? What was his work? To prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. Before the second coming of Christ, God sent the three angels' messages to prepare every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people for the crisis and the coming of the Lord. Before the Sabbath is the day of preparation. My brothers and sisters, the religion of the Bible, you can go from Genesis to Revelation and follow from beginning to end that the religion of God is a religion of preparation. Now notice that the greatest thing that we need is God inside of us. Now notice Exodus 15. Are you there, amen? amen. Let us read that together. Exodus 15 in verse 2. Let's read that together. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 2. What does the Bible say? It says, the Lord is my strength and song. And he is become my God. is talking about salvation. He says, he is my God. And I will, talk to me somebody, prepare him a what? Habitation, my father's God. And I will exalt him. Question. In order for God to inhabit us, what must we do? Prepare. There must be a preparation. Now, now what if I don't prepare? <clears throat> what if I don't prepare? God cannot inhabit me. Salvation is dependent upon this. You remember when the sanctuary was getting ready to be built? Before God could dwell in them, there had to be a what? Talk to me, somebody. Someone had to build or prepare that sanctuary. Now, watch what the prophet says. In the book, Early Writings, page 71, watch what the prophet says. Now, I want you to look at me. Follow the teacher, Olivia. Follow the teacher. Follow the teacher. Watch now. What did it say? I saw that many were neglecting the preparation. Good. So needful. And we're looking to the time of refreshing in the latter rain to fit them to stand in the day of the Lord and to live where? Talk to me, somebody. In his sight. Oh, how many I saw in the time of trouble without a... Why were they in the time of trouble without a shelter? Why? Why? It says they had neglected the needful... So what do we need right now? Talk to me, somebody. Preparation. So God is trying to teach us how to prepare. The religion of God is a religion of preparation from beginning to end. So if the devil can stop me from learning how to prepare, he can stop me from letting God inhabit me. Do you know, brothers and sisters, right now, God wants to prepare us for the life that we live in here and now, for the storms of everyday life. Do you know a storm comes to us every day, a challenge every day, every week, and God wants to prepare us for that. You know that even after this Sabbath, when you go home, there's going to be something for you to face, something for our children to face, something for our families to face. Something for us to face. And in order to meet it, we have to do what? Talk to me. If a child is going to be prepared for life or ready for life, he must go through a process of preparation. The adult must go through a process of preparation. Now, my brothers and sisters, not only must we prepare for this life, but we know that soon is going to come a crisis. And the only way to go through that coming crisis, we have to guess what? Prepare. When the son-in-law passes and the time of trouble takes place, no one will go through that who has not made the needed preparation. And my brothers and sisters, finally, when Jesus comes, he's going to take us to the hereafter at the coming of Christ, where we can spend eternity with him. But only the ones that are going to be ready with, to meet Christ are going to be those who have learned to prepare. So whether the preparation is at eternity, at the coming of Christ, whether it's in the coming crisis or right now, today, in every day of life, 
The one secret is we must learn how to prepare for what we face. You know, the number one thing we're not doing is preparing. Now, my brothers and sisters, that's why that God told me as I was communing with God, emphasize to the church the necessity of preparation. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says they had neglected the need for preparation. Therefore, they could not receive the refreshing that all must have to fit them to live in the sight of a holy God. God. Talk about the way of holiness. It says those who refuse to be hewed by the prophets and fail to purify their souls in obeying the whole truth and are willing to believe that their condition is what? Talk to me. You know that right now we want to be told that our marriage is far better than it is. Our home is far better than it is. Our children are far better than they are. That we as adults are far better than we are. It says that that, that they want to believe that their condition is far better than it really is. They will come up to the time of the falling of the plague. Now, do you know when the flakes fall, something has happened. Probation has closed. That means they will wait too late. It says they will come up to the time of the falling of the plagues and then see that they needed to be hewed and squared for the building. But there will be no time time then to do it and no mediator to plead their cause before the father. If we're going to prepare, we need two things. If we're going to prepare, we need two things. What do we need? Talk to me, somebody. We need time and we need a mediator. What are the two things we need? What time Time and a mediator? Who is the mediator? Jesus. Jesus in his work as high priest. Will he remain a priest forever? Yes or no? Michael will stand up. Michael will leave our case. And so we need Jesus, the mediator, and we need time. Now, guess what? Time is running out. And so my brothers and sisters, God is trying to show us something. Look what it says. Earl writings continues. Before this time, the awfully solemn declaration has gone forth. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be what? Holy still. It says, we should therefore be drawing nearer and nearer to the Lord and earnestly seeking that what? Preparation Preparation necessary to enable us to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Let all remember that God is a holy, uh, God is holy and that none but what? None but what? Holy beings can ever dwell in his. So the religion of God is a religion of preparation. If we want God to live in us. Now, Jesus as he got closer and closer to the end, sought to boil this down from sap into syrup, from something watery into something sweet. Now, I want to ask you a question. What did Jesus boil it all down to? Go to Matthew. What book did I say? Go to Matthew chapter 22. Let's go to Matthew now. Matthew 22. We're building the case in Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Now, as you get to the end of Christ's life and you look at it over and over again, as he is condensed as he uh, concentrated, as he did this, he boiled down the religion of preparation. He boiled it down to one thing. That's amazing. Imagine taking hundreds of things and then reducing it to one thing. You had to be intelligent. So in Matthew 22, Jesus took everything that it was necessary to prepare and he couched it in one thing. Guess what he did? What would you say? Merits! Talk to me, Brother Tony. He got up early this morning. So Jesus condensed everything now in this religion of preparation. He condensed the preparation, the getting ready into one thing. And he called it what? Talk to me, somebody. Marriage. You better watch it. Because as Jesus got to the end of his life, he spoke of marriage over and over and more and more. And as we get near to the end of time, you and I must understand marriage far better than we do today. In fact, in Matthew 22, notice what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 22. All right, uh, Brother Tony, would you read this for us? Let me see what you have read to us. Matthew chapter 22. Look what the Bible says in Matthew 22, beginning in verse 2. <clears throat> Here's Jesus talking, verse 2. He made a what? Talk to me, somebody. So Jesus now, as he's teaching, he's getting to the end of time. Now, when a man knows he has a little time left, he tries to condense much into little. Jesus in Matthew 22 only has a few days left before he dies. In chapter 23, if you go to the next chapter, you're going to find out it was Wednesday. He died on Friday. And so he only had a couple of days left. So 
So Jesus now is condensing and boiling and he's trying to make it simple. And you and I at the end of time, we should be studying what he studied in the final moments of his life. And Matthew 22 begins to speak of this marriage. And he began to speak of the, the readiness for the marriage. So marriage and getting ready for it was what he condensed everything into in order to make the necessary preparation. Look at what it says in Matthew 22, same chapter. We want to jump down now to verse 4. Matthew 22 and verse 4. What does the Bible say in verse 4? Let's read that together. The Bible says, and he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fattenings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the... So we see that Jesus connects marriage and getting ready for that marriage as the one essential thing of preparation. Are you following me? So now Jesus, the great teacher, is trying to tell us if we're going to understand how to get ready in the last days, we must understand that. Now, Jesus has been pleased to represent the most essential preparation under this figure. Now, that means that we have to know what marriage is. Am I right? So if we're going to be ready for the time of trouble, what must happen between us and God? What must happen between us and God? We must be what? Talk to me. We must be married. And there's a readiness or preparation for that marriage. Now, you remember in Matthew 24, he spoke of the days of Solomon and Gomorrah. He spoke of the days of Noah before the flood. Am I right? And he said, in those days, there will be marrying and what else? Giving a marriage. He's talking about that which will prevent them from being prepared. Dealing with marriage. Chapter 25. He deals with the ten virgins. The ten virgin parable. And the ones that were ready, they went into the marriage and the door was shut. Matthew 23. Uh, excuse me. Matthew chapter 22, chapter 24, chapter 25. Again and again, marriage and its readiness. Marriage and its readiness. Marriage and its readiness. You can trace this all the way through to Revelation. In Revelation it says that the lamb's wife has made herself ready. It's time for the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation 19, 7 and 8. So my brothers and sisters, if we're going to understand preparation, we must understand marriage and how to get. Now I want to ask you a question. What is a marriage? Because in order to get ready for the coming of the Lord, for the crisis that is coming and for the life that now is, we must understand marriage symbolizes all of it. Marriage is an educational example. It is a what? Education. Educational example. What do I mean by educational example? What do I mean by that? That it is an example by which we learn from. So God gave us marriage as an educational example. It was illustrating instruction. So that you and I could see the illustration of the thing that God was teaching. And God was pleased to show us this. Now question, if we're going to get ready then, we have to understand what marriage is. Because right now, can you imagine a child, what does it mean to marry God? Are we just going to stand there and take a vow? Oh, God, I marry you. And all of a sudden, then we kiss him and we kiss the bride. Is that what it's talking about? So unless we have a better understanding of what marriage is, we don't really know how to prepare for the here and now, for the coming crisis or for the near future. Question. What is marriage? What is marriage? Yes, my friend. Let's give him a microphone. Where's where that microphone? Thank you. Brother Desarme, talk to me. What is marriage? Yes. Let's all go there. Genesis 2. Yes. All right. All right, that's the sap. Give me the syrup. Now you're right, you're right. You're, you're making me excited too. You're right on the point. Very good. But you're, you're right there. <laughs> All right, very good. Very good, very good, though. Very good, Brother Desarme. Very good, Brother Desarme. All right, Sister Shiloh, talk to us. Talk to us. What is, what, what is it? Talk to me. Marriage. So marriage, very good, Sister Shiloh, very good. Number one, marriage has to do with relationship. That's the first point that needs to be considered. It has to do with relationship. Very good. Now, why is this so? See, my brother and sister, you will find out that there are many types of relationships. You know that an enemy is still a relationship. And somebody said, that's my enemy. You're showing me how you relate to that person. 
so, so, so to prepare, there's a certain type of relationship, and the relationship is not an enemy. That's not going to help us. What we must learn to enter into is a relationship that is the most special, the most close, or the closest of any relationship on this earth. Whereby you can only enter into it with one person. Now, my, the Bible says in Genesis 2, it brings this out. It says, therefore shall a man leave his what? Father and mother. That's a relationship. That relationship is father and mother. But that's not the relationship this is talking about. It says, and shall cleave unto his what? Now, when it says cleave unto his wife, it's identifying the relationship. Who has a wife? One that's married. Who has a husband? One that's married. What makes them husband and wife? The marriage. So it says, and they shall be what? Talk to me, somebody. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So they take two and make them one is the work of the marriage relationship. To take two and make them one is the work of the what? <coughs> now listen, today is a high Sabbath. You know, a high Sabbath is when a ceremonial Sabbath fell on a weekly Sabbath. Now the day is the weekly Sabbath, the seven day Sabbath. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible called it a high Sabbath because the ceremonial Sabbath of the unleavened bread fell upon the same seven day Sabbath and it made it a high Sabbath. Today is a high Sabbath because we have a weekly Sabbath, but the day is also my anniversary with my wife. Amen. We got married 22 years ago today. Amen. 22 years. Now, I want you to understand something. Now, I want you to understand something. When we got married, something happened. Marriage made something happen. The two became one. Now, how are, is my wife and I one? Because the Bible says two become one flesh. And it's saying one flesh. Flesh is deal with physical. So my wife and I are not joined together by the arm. Am I right, Micah? You couldn't talk to her if we were joined together like that, could you? <laughs> there is not this one that way. So how could it happen? Tell me, how are my wife and I one or any marriage? How are the two people one? They're one, talk to me, sister. Now, she said they're one in what? Now, I want to ask you a question. Where's that in the Bible? Because see, we see the oneness. Brother Desiree May showed me Genesis 2. Marriage is this relationship where two become one. In other words, when we get married to God, it's more than physical uniting. God is trying to make him and I one. That's the day of atonement, the day of atonement. This is what the marriage is all about. This is what life is for. And do you know that our problems will be solved if we became one with God? Economic problems, health problems, social problems, marital problems, family problems, life problems. Solved if we became one with God. And I'm not speaking uh, 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 just in some poetic way. I mean in real life. Now, my brothers and sisters, the question is, how do we know that the mind is what joins two together? Together. <coughs> Excuse me. How do we know that the mind is what joins two together? All right. We don't have much time because we, we, we got to go somewhere today. So I'm, I'm, I'm helping you out. All right. Yes. In Revelation, Revelation 17. Now that's true. I don't want to go there, but that's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. First Corinthians. That's where I want to go. Let's go to first Corinthians. Now, good. You're helping me. Now, remember, we put pieces on the puzzle. All the weeks as we study, we've been putting pieces out there. Now we must join them together. Let's go quickly. First Corinthians chapter one. How do we become one? Revelation 17 tells us, but it's in the counterfeit. 1 Corinthians 1 tells us, but it's in the true, the genuine. And 1 Corinthians chapter 1, notice what the Bible, well, no, 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 no. We're going quickly, but I want you to make sure that you're following. Where in 1 Corinthians 1 do you think we're going to go to? Where in 1 Corinthians 1? Verse 10. Very good. You're making me happy that we're together. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. Let's read that together. 1 Corinthians 1. In fact, no, let me ask uh, 1 Corinthians 1. Uh, uh, some, is one of our young people there already? 1 Corinthians 1. Somebody in 1 Corinthians 1 already? Are you there? First Corinthians 1. Who's in 1 Corinthians 1? Okay, no, no young person there. Next time, okay. Sister Desarme, would you read it for us? 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. Now, you've got to turn there quickly, young people, because I want to get to you. 1 Corinthians 1. Would you read verse 10, please? Where's the, the microphone, please? 1 Corinthians 1. Now, I need you to help me out with that. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. What does the Bible say in verse 10? That you all speak the what? Same thing. Now, what is a division? What is a division? So if there's no division, what does that tell me? That they're not separated, they're united. Continue. No 
Not just a little bit, but that you be what? Perfectly joined where? How? So how are we joined to become one? How, how are two made one? Talk to me, somebody. Same mind and same what? Now, what does it mean by judgment? Anybody know what it means by judgment? Anybody know what that word judgment means? The word judgment means decision. So thinking and decision. You know that I can think about something but never come to a decision. Somebody's buying a car and they're looking at five cars and they start thinking through and they say, you know what? That car is a, it's parts are not so good. That car, it can't get me where I'm going. I need four by four. That car and then reduce down to two cars, two vehicles. So I've been thinking, but I'm not buying two vehicles. I need to buy how many? One. So I'm thinking through, but then eventually I can come to a decision that say I'm going to buy one car. So there's a difference between thinking and decision. Are you understanding what I'm telling you? But if two people are joined together, they must learn to think alike until they come to the place where they make the same decisions. Then they become one, not in the body, but physically they act the same. They carry out the same principles in the flesh because they're one in the mind. Their theories, their ideas, and so now their habits and practices become alike. And therefore, revival and reformation. Does it make sense, yes or no? Yes. All right, let's go a little further. So now when I say in the mind, what's in the mind? Talk to me. What's in the mind? What's in the mind? What's in the mind? One, two. What's in the mind? Thinking and this. What do I make a decision? Do I make a decision with my hands? No. Where do I make a decision? In the mind. Where do I think? In my mind. So the two things that the mind does in developing a relationship, we must have thoughts that lead to a decision. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Praise God. Let's go a little further. Now, my brothers and sisters, once you understand that, you begin to start seeing that the devil wants to do something. The devil wants to do something with us. The devil wants to do something. I put it here. The devil wants to do something with us. Look what it says that the devil wants to do. You should know this uh, by now. Look what it says. This says, <clears throat> Second Mind Character 698, for thousands of years, Satan has been experimenting upon the properties of the... <clears throat> what does he want to do? Influence our thinking and decision. It says, and has learned to know it well, talking about the human mind. By his subtle working in these last days, he, Satan, is doing what? Give me another name for linking. Joining the human mind with his how? What's in that mind? Imbuing it with his thoughts. And he's doing this work in so deceptive of a manner that those who accept his guidance know not that they are being led by who is the him? Satan at his will. So now my brothers and sisters, the great deceiver hopes to sow. What does he want to do to our minds? He wants to bring in confusion. The minds of men and women that none but his voice will be heard. Now I'm going to ask you a question. So what is Satan trying to do? He's trying to gain control of our thinking and our decisions. Why? So that he can link us with himself. You see, whoever you're linked with, that's who you're married to. So then what if I accept Satan's thoughts and make decisions based on the thinking of Satan? I now do what? Now, do you know how long marriage is for? Marriage is forever. To death. Do you know what the mark of the beast tells me? What does the mark of the beast tell me? That I have married Satan. And that the thoughts will not change. And my decisions will not change. What does the seal of God tell me? That I've married Jesus. And even if the devil tries to kill me, I won't change the way I think. My decisions will remain this way forever. No matter what the world does, I will follow Jesus. And so my brothers and sisters, every thought and decision before that time is preparing us for one or the other of the two different relationships. Either married to God or married to Satan. Now, if I want to make it in life, which one do I need to be married to? God. If I want to be protected, which one do I need to be married to? God. And so you see the devil now is trying to influence us in this direction. Now, look at what it says. It says in the book of 1 Corinthians 7, go over just a few uh, uh, chapters or books. Go to 1 Corinthians 7. Now, what I want to do is show us one of the mind, one of the way of thinking that's on the mind of a married person. A married person must think a certain way. And if they're not thinking this way, then they're not going to be married very long. A married man or a married woman must learn to think a certain way. And if they don't think that way, they won't be married very what? Long. Now, what do you call when two people don't get along in marriage and they begin to stop interacting properly and they begin to do something with each other? What happens? 
separation. Now, separation is not divorce, but separation is a step toward divorce. So Satan first, Micah, Satan first wants to make us separated from God, and then he wants to divorce us from God. Now, divorce is eternal. Separation can be temporary. And God wants to make the separation never happen again. And Satan wants to make our separation eternal. Now, let's go a little further. Now, what is the way of thinking that must be ours if we're going to be married to God and stay in marriage? Look at 1 Corinthians 7. Look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7. And I want to ask if uh, Mother Parker, if you'll read this for us, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And we're going to look at verse 32. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 32. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 1 Corinthians 7. What book did I say? 1 Corinthians. What chapter? 7. Now let's look at verse 32. What does this say in uh, 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 32? <clears throat> in other words, I wouldn't have you with anxious, uh, 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 anxious uh, thought. Continue. So he said, a man that is not married, he doesn't have to think about everything else. His full thought is only on God. Are you following me? But what about a married man? Next verse. Continue on. So what should be on the mind of that husband? <coughs> excuse me. What should be on the mind of that husband if he wants to stay married? How to please, I'm going to just put spouse. Is that all right? On his mind, he's thinking about how to please his wife. What should be on the mind of the wife if she wants to stay in a beautiful marriage? Verse 34. <coughs> verse 34. Uh, would you read for us 34, Sister Chanel? 1 Corinthians 7, verse 34, please. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. Is there a difference? Yes. yes. Continue. Look at, the, look at the verse. Look at the verse. That she may be what? Holy. Holy. Continue. Both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be husband. What was the common denominator? What was the same in each case? If you're going to be married, what does the mind tell me? What way of thinking? Talk to me. How to please what? Wow. Now, remember I gave you the example the day before? Here's a man that's married. And he comes out of his house and he has a suit on. And his wife says to him, you know, uh, Jeff, I don't like that suit. And Jackie says, Jeff, you don't like the, uh, the suit? Well, I don't care what you like. Jenny likes my suit. What's happening to his marriage? It's getting ready to fall apart. Am I right? Why? He's no longer interested in what pleases his wife. His wife. Now, what about uh, Susie? She comes out now out of the marriage. <laughs> and Susie, she's making food. And now, all of a sudden, here comes Sean as he sees the food being made. And he says, oh, Susie, I, I, I'm thankful that you made that, but, but, but that's not really what I wanted. Is it possible we can have something else? Oh, no, Sean. I'm not interested in making what you like. Don't you know that, 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 that uh, Jimmy is coming to, break, uh, to dinner? Uh -oh. And that's what Jimmy likes. Uh -oh. What's getting ready to happen? Separation, Separation or what? Divorce. Now, I speak of it this way. But when a man is interested in not pleasing his spouse, he's preparing for a divorce and separation. Are you following? Yeah. So now, what should be the mind that we have toward God, our spouse? Our mind, if we're going to stay married to God, our mind should be thinking, how can we what? Now, the only way to know what pleases God, where has he put what pleases him? Where has he put that? In, the word. <coughs> In his word. And by studying the word of God, we find out what pleases him. Am I right or wrong? So my brothers and sisters, when we look at this, when we deal with hair, we are not talking about just saying what pleases me, the hair I like or the hair I want to wear. When we're thinking about hair, we're thinking about something. Because remember now, holiness is what? Constant agreement with God. 
We're thinking in the mind of how to please him so that we think the way what he thinks. Now, why do we wear our hair the way we wear our hair? We're getting ready to deal with the practices now. Why do we wear the hair the way we wear our hair? Because of the way we think. Now, if we're thinking right, we should wear our hair the way we do in order to do what? Talk to me. Now, if we're not interested, you know, if God says that does not please me, that hair is an abomination. I hate it. I don't like it. And we still wear it anyway. You know, what we're really showing we don't really want to marry Jesus. Does it make sense? So my brothers and sisters, then as we study through and we look at modern hairstyles, I don't care what the hairstyle is. You have many different modern hairstyles. When we're looking at it, we're not looking. Oh, I like the color. Or I don't like the color. Or I like the part. I don't like the part. Or I like the way that's shaped. That's not how you make a judgment if we're trying to marry Jesus. If we're trying to get ready for the crisis, for the coming of the Lord, for the life that now is, our thought is, how can we best please God? And we're going to see that that makes all the difference. When we think that way, then it makes very simple why there's a relationship between hair and holiness. Because then that will make us say, what does God think about hair so that I can agree with God? Does that make sense? Now, my brothers and sisters, in your mind, you should be able to just quickly throw down something. How many type of hairstyles are there in this world today? There are only two. Now, you look at all those and say, well, that's different. But no, no, no. As we study the Bible, as we put down the pieces together, we find out that really there are only two different ways of what? Of life. Only two different ways of life. And we're going to find out again. You tell me, what are the two different ways of life? Talk to me. What are the two different ways of life? Talk to me. One is the way of life that we can just put over here the way of life is the way of life and the two the second way is the way of what the way of death now question where would i find these two ways from where could i go in the bible to see these two ways where would i go in the bible because see now listen no no i want you to understand what we're doing as we come back we'll come back to these two ways i want you to understand what we're doing is god even interested in our hair is god interested in our hair yes or no i want you to understand what we're doing If we're getting ready to understand for ourselves and also be able to teach others, we have to know how to begin to teach. Now, if somebody comes to you and say, am I wearing my hair right? And you say, oh, no, you shouldn't wear your hair like that. You know what you're doing? You're not thinking like God is thinking. And you're not going to help them to think like God is thinking. And if we are not thinking like God, can we marry him? Yes or no? no? And so my brothers and sisters, we have to look back now and see how does God think? So that I can begin thinking that way and help others to think the way God has helped me to think. So now, my brothers and sisters, when we approach the subject of hair, what should be the first step we're dealing with is the fact of relationship. God is not interested simply in hair. He's interested in relationship. So when a person deals with hair or any subject, first step is relationship to God. I remember I was driving home with a man and his wife had uh, 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 convinced him to come to our house. I never met any of them before, but they said we're having problems in marriage, but we want to have our marriage solved. So they came over. When they came for a few days, the husband, you can tell from the very beginning, he didn't want to be there at all. But he just listened to his wife. His wife said, look, if you don't come, we're getting a divorce. None of you know them, so praise the Lord. <laughs> anyway, as it went forward, one time the man was by himself with me and we started talking. And he said, oh, my wife. It seemed like she listens to you all the time. And I said, oh. Then he said, and I got to ask you a question. You think I'm going to be lost if I eat meat? You think I'm going to be lost and go to hell because I eat meat? And I said, have you ever heard me say that to you? He said, no. I said, you know what I'm interested in? I'm interested that you have a relationship with Christ. Are you interested in having a relationship with Jesus? Yes, I am. I said, now, if Jesus is interested in your health, should you be interested in your health? Yes, I should. And we began to start talking from the standpoint of relationship until before he left, he left with the mindset of wanting to be plant-based. But not only plant-based, he left wanting to be the friend of God. You see, my brothers and sisters, first step is always relationship. So when Sister Shiloh said relationship on our last page, that was significant. And a true relationship of marriage says, I want to please God, not myself. 
Now, when I deal with hair, you must start there. Now, once you see that, then we begin to start saying, is God interested in hair? Because if God is not interested in hair, neither am I. Is God interested in hair? Yes. Yes. Let me show you something. Go to Daniel chapter 3. What book did I say? Go to Daniel chapter 3. I want to show you something because if God is not interested in hair, neither should we and we'll be all right. In the book of Daniel chapter 3, notice what the Bible says in Daniel 3. It tells us the story of the three Hebrew, the Hebrew, Hebrew worthies. What was their name? Talk to me. I mean, don't tell me Shadrach. Don't tell me Meshach. And don't tell me Abednego. You tell me, what, what were their names? Hananiah. What else? Michelle. Azariah. Praise God. 